Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this seminar organized by the Development Economics Research Group on uh, global value chains and trade in the age of COVID-19. As you all know, since the early 1990s, we have seen remarkable improvements in transport, information and communication technology which together with greater openness to trade and investment have led to the progressive deepening of integration in the global economy. As a production has fragmented across national boundaries, we have seen also deepening input output relationships between countries. And that has meant that the destinies of nations are increasingly intertwined, uh, which is a grand way of saying that GDP is increasingly correlated. But this period of hyper-globalization received a first big shock with the Great Recession in 2008 and 2009. And then we entered this period of what has been referred to as the great flattening, where trade as a share of GDP stopped growing and where global value chains stopped their expansion. Even as we were struggling to recover from that great recession, a period of trade tensions and increasing uh, mutual protection between the United States and China generated further uncertainty, which also had a chilling effect on trade and global value chains. Now we see a third shock, perhaps the most serious shock, an unusual shock. It's a shock to both demand because people cannot spend and to supply because it's hard for people to work. And it's affecting not one country, like, for example, the Japanese tsunami or the American mortgage crisis, but it's almost at the same time affecting many countries. As Daria Taglioni has shown, that some of the most important nodes in the global economy, as uh, uh, she calculated some time ago, that 17 countries which had seen the largest number of cases accounted for more than 70% of global trade. And finally, because it's an unusually uncertain shock, both in depth and duration, therefore, it's also turning into a financial shock. So how these developments interact in the age of flattening global value chains will be discussed today by three luminaries in the field. First, we begin with Richard Baldwin, who has really shaped our thinking in this whole area. Richard is professor of international economics at the Graduate Institute. He's been the editor in chief of Vox EU since June 2007. I could say many things about his multiple accomplishments, but let me focus on his 2016 book, The Great Convergence, Information Technology and the New Globalization, Lawrence Summers called it one of the five most important books on globalization ever. And his more recent book, The Globotics Upheaval, is uh, been published in 2019 and has been almost as influential in helping us think about what's happening. So. I was tempted to use Richard's original title of his Vox EU column, which has many medical metaphors. It was called Supply Chain Contagion Waves, Manufacturing Contagion and Reinfection from the COVID Concussion. But he has chosen today a less dramatic title, which is Thinking Ahead on COVID-19 and GVCs. So Richard, why don't we begin with you? And I'll introduce the other speakers after you finish. Richard, you're muted. 
It's a pleasure to be here with all of you. What I want to do in the next uh, 15 minutes is run through a few points, um, not so much to inform you as to sort of inspire thinking and discussion about what's going on. I think there are big implications of COVID for global value chains, but I think a lot of people are, are misthinking them and uh, missing a few points. So let me just get started with what I'm hoping to do today. So the, if I can get this, there we go. The outline of the talk is I'm going to have three parts. The first is the nature and the duration of the shock. Now, this is going to involve talking a little bit about medical things. But one of the uh, first aspects of misthinking, which I think is systemic, is uh, people not realizing how long and how deep and how, how uncoordinated this shock is going to be. And the second part is why this shock is so different from the 2008, 2009 one. And then the last, I'm gonna talk about this supply cont contagion and recontagion. And if I have time, I'll say a few words about whether there's gonna be long-term damage to global value chains or not. So let me just start getting into the medical imperative. So we've all heard that we have to flatten the epi curve or the epidemiological curve. Um, and let me just go through that because I think it's important to understanding the length and the nature of this thing. So what this blue curve here is the number of new cases. Uh, and when it, and this is uh, on the horizontal axis week, so the, the vertical axis is the number of people. And in the beginning, it doesn't look like very much. That's the discovery and initiation phase. But then we go into the acceleration phase where people are getting pe other people sick or getting other people sick. And the number of new cases can double every two or three days. So it tends to overwhelm government's ability to think ahead or plan because by the time they form the committee, it's already doubled or tripled or quadrupled what it was before. But um, as the number of people getting the new infection ramps up, with about a two week lag, the number of people who are recovering is also ramping up. And I'll, we'll, we'll follow that for a second. We'll, we'll show that that, that actually has a, a big implication. But the point about this is, this, these are the new infections. And one of the interesting things, one of the important things about this disease is that although it's explosively contagious, it's not very deadly. So the number of hospitalizations coming from these new cases is about a 10th or a fifth of what they are. But each one of these new hospital admissions stays in there for two weeks or three weeks sometimes. So the cumulative number of people in the hospital climbs uh, look much higher than the, than, than the number of hospitalization and it peaks a little bit later. So if the number of hospitalization overwhelms the hospital capacity, we get this overload and excess deaths. In fact, it can be quite traumatic. The things you've seen going on in Italy and in New York and in Spain, what went on in Wuhan, these are things that really make uh, people very, very upset and governments take extreme measures to avoid this kind of overwhelming things. So that's essentially where the imperative comes because more people will die than is necessary and the way they die is very um, traumatic and people are, are uh, view it as absolute imperative not to, to, not to do that. So avoiding this yellow is not a balancing between GDP and jobs or dollars and deaths, it's an imperative. Now what I wanna talk about is uh, next, how this is connected with the economic shock, the recession, which then hits GDPs. So if you take this yellow, this red curve as what the ep epidemiological curve would look like without containment policies, in order to avoid that overloading, we have containment policies, lockdowns and things like that, that flatten and spread out the epi, the epi curve. Now those containment policies also make the recession, which would be rather short uh, and not too not too deep if, it, if there were no containment policies, it makes the recession much deeper. And in rich countries, at least, governments use economic policy to flatten the recession curve by spending truly historic sums of money to try and protect the economy and also to uh, in, in, in share income and redistribute the cost a little bit. So that's how we have these containment policies are a medical imperative. And at least in rich countries, they're using the economic policy to counter them. But it's worthwhile saying that um, the economic recession 
is really a health, uh, a health measure. Now, the containment policies are inducing a rather unusual recession. Most recessions are just a lack of spending, and central banks or governments can undo the recession by stimulating spending. But this containment policy is hitting the supply side and hitting the, the, the supply chains and the financial sector, all of this all at the same time, and it's done on purpose. So it's difficult to just fix one bit or another bit. It's shutting it down quite systematically. So as a consequence, this recession is a complex supply shock and a demand shock all at the same time. Moreover, it's happening at different times in different countries around the world. And because they're linked by global value chains and also just regular trade, the shock is being uh, transmitted internationally. So the next thing I want to talk about is how long will the shock last? Are we talking about a couple of quarters? As it seems like many of the investment banks and some of the international organizations are projecting that, that the second half of this year will all be positive and will start to come back. Or are we talking about a couple of years? And my opinion is I think people are way underestimating how long this shock is going to last. And I want to convince you that by looking at a little bit of epidemiology. And we've all had to become a little bit uh, epidemiologists uh, in, in, in the, uh, the last couple months. The good thing is epidemiologists have had to learn a little bit of economics as well. So, so the model that, that this, is a, this is like the supply and demand model of epidemiology is called the S I R model. So I for infectious, S for susceptible. I, I made a mistake that should be an S and R for recovered. That's where the model name comes from, S I R. Now here's how it works. You divide the population into three bins, infectious people, susceptible people and recovered. People who are infected can give it. People who are susceptible can get it. And people who are recovered are immune. Now, the new cases is what we were talking about before. That's the epidemiological. This is the explosive contagion in the first place. And then there's a deceleration. And there's a steady stream of people who are recovering going from infectious to recovered. Now, uh, when you want to look at the dynamics of that whole thing, it's useful to, first of all, point out that this is exactly what China, China did. They went through the, this is the daily cases. This is their epi curve. They went through the accelerating phase the decelerating phase, and now they've seems to have at least put it to, to bed, although they're getting a second wave. We'll talk about that. But to think about how long this is going to last, I, I did some illust illustrative dynamics. So don't take any of this serious. I'm not an epidemiologist, and lots of people are doing real simulations. I just want to illustrate the dynamics so we can get our mind around how like, likely, how long this thing is likely to happen. So this is when there is no reduction in the um, in the containment policies or anything. So this orange thing, the num the stock of infected people rises very quickly at peak and then it comes down. And what that's consisting of is this red curve, which is the new cases. So that's the ep epi curve over here. It looks like that. And the green is the recovered cases, which looks a lot like the new cases, but just delayed because of the recovery. Now, when the number of new cases equal the number of recovered, that's when we're at the peak. And once we get past the peak, we can start to get better. And what the black curve is showing is the number of people who've had it, and that starts rising, and then it sort of levels off as the stock comes down. Okay, so what I'd like to do is put some orders of magnitude on this to argue this is way far from over. So I'm just gonna do some simple math with this model. Beta is the number of infectious contacts per period per infected person. So that's a, a medical kind of parameter, but it's also connected with, or can be influenced by social distancing. So the number of new cases is this beta parameter times the number of people who are infected times the fraction of the people they meet that are susceptible. So if, if uh, half the population has it, so N is the, the, the size of the population, S are the number of people susceptible. So if this ratio is one half, then only half of those contacts by infectious people will actually lead to new infections. The new recovers, recoveries is even easier. It's just gamma, which is a recovery rate, which is medically given, times I. So the top of the infection is when the new cases equal the new recoveries. And if you just cancel out the I, you get this extremely simple formula. 
that the fraction of the population who has not had it that, that are still susceptible is gamma over beta. Now, gamma over beta is equal to one over R naught, and R naught is this very famous statistic that gets estimated all over the time. And the estimates for COVID is that R naught is between two and three. So that means when R naught is mo not modified by containment policies, something like between half and uh, a third of the people will not get it, and everybody else will get it. Now, in, we don't know exactly how many people have got it, but it's at least an order of magnitude less than would need to be before this thing goes into herd immunity and getting rid of it. Now, the point of that is it, a couple points. One, if you reduce beta by half, let's say through containment policies or mask or whatever you do, then you're going to double the number of people who do not get it. So you save a huge number of lives. But as soon as you let beta go back up to where it was before by relaxing containment policies, this dynamic will come again. So there almost surely will be second and third waves. As we start to relax the restraints, we will get more and more waves. And they're also, importantly for global value chains, they're not synchronized across the world. Okay. So now what I want to do is argue that this is different. So the, in 2008, 2009, it was sudden, severe, and synchronized, but it was basically all coming from the demand side. So apart from the United States, the UK, and a few other very, very clever countries who got into this financial engineering, most countries in the world had nothing to do with the subprime crisis. So their financial sector was not directly hit by this. For most of the world, it was a great big demand shock, which led to a great big trade collapse, and all the global value chains shut down at the same time. So the global value chain contagion wasn't really that important during the 2009, because everybody shut down at the same time, and people started coming back up more at the same time. And in any case, the supply chains weren't damaged. What happened was there was just a lack of aggregate demand. And once the demand was restored, we were good to go. This time, as Adita mentioned that Daria has calculated, it hit all the biggest traders and manufacturers within two months, more or less simultaneously, but on the supply side and the de demand side. So there was, uh, there has been some damage in terms of bankruptcy, but in any case, the supply chain was directly shut down either by transportation limitations or by lockdowns of factories. The second, the third point is that global value chain integration is much bigger than it was back then. And here you can see a slide that I put together. This is from a, a Vox column that I posted a, a few weeks ago and was calculation by Rebecca Friedman. So the exposure, what this shows is a higher exposure to inputs. Now what this table does, is it shows the total exposure of the row nations manufacturing to the column nations manufacturing inputs in 2015. So you can see the Inputs from the US, from Germany, and for China are, are important for basically everybody. And Japan and Korea are also basically important for everybody. And countries, their uh, sus susceptibility to the inputs from other countries um, are shown here. And you can see there's a regionalization of these. This is factory North America, this is factory Europe, and this is factory Asia. But Asia is important for everybody and so is Germany. So the idea here is, if factory China shuts down, for example, Mexico is, Mexico's value uh, manufacturing is heavily dependent upon China. So when China's shut down, that's going to affect Mexico. And when Mexico shuts down, that's going to affect the United States because the United States is, uh, is reliant on Mexico for the, this is 1.6. So you get these echoes going through and these numbers are larger than they were before. So it's, it's, a, it's um, a different crisis and it's uh, uh, gonna affect through global value chains uh, more importantly. So the, the last point I wanna talk about is this contagion. So I'm just gonna take the example of the United States and uh, the US and those two countries, uh, manufacturing sectors are, are pretty integrated. So when, when uh, China shut down that it impacted manufacturing in the United States, and China also um, was the source of the contagion to the United States. And now China is getting better, so their manufacturing sector is, is back on its feet. 
But the U.S. is experiencing a huge outbreak of COVID, and therefore its manufacturing is sh shutting down, either because of plant closures or difficult of transportation. Turns out there's a lot of air transportation and sea transportation problems. So the supply chain problems that uh, China is now facing is in part because of their supply chain dependence on the United States and the U.S. and other people are reinfecting China. So the idea is that this contagion and reinfection could continue for quite a while, as long as the, the, uh, we, we don't have a vaccine or we don't acquire herd immunity. So um, I don't know how am I doing on time, Adita? Do, should I, I have a couple more slides. I don't want to talk about the future or should I just stop here? I, th I think I started. A... Richard, why don't you take another minute because I think it's interesting to hear about how you see things evolving. Okay. So um, my argument is that the, the value chains are not going to be affected. And I think there's a great deal of woolly and wishful thinking. And instead, we should think about sources of hysteresis. So there's all sorts of people who said, oh, my goodness, we can't rely again on X, Y, and Z country. We should have it all at home. First of all, that's just wrong because you should be diversifying risk, not concentrating it. But the second is, did anything really change? When the European people in the European Commission or the European Council say we should think about not being so reliant on China, well, unless they actually change anything, it's going to go back because you need a permanent change in global value chain. It will require government subsidies, government mandated stockpiles, desertification, or massive tariffs on inputs and final goods to move anything. So I'm quite willing to accept that when it comes to medical equipment, we'll see some changes. But are people really going to be able be willing to pay 10, 20% more for their cars, 50% or 100% more for their electronics for all sorts of gadgets that are made around the world? Are they going to do that on the abstract possibility that something's going to happen in the future? Because after all, the global value chain allocation, what we actually have now, is really balancing reward cost savings against risk. It's just a portfolio problem. And unless something moves this indifference curve, which is set by private firms interested in a profit this quarter, or something moves the risk reward frontier, we're going to go back as soon as the shock passes to the way it was before. So I think a lot of the discussion about this is finally the time we're going to unwind global value chains, I think that's wishful and woolly thinking. So I'll stop right there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard, for that excellent introduction. Uh, after Richard, we have uh, Vasco Carvalho. He's a professor of economics at uh, the University of Cambridge, professor of macroeconomics, and also the senior Keynes fellow in Cambridge. Again, he has done a lot to shape our understanding of how production networks affect macroeconomic propagation. He was awarded the 2014 Wiley Prize in Economics by the British Academy for achievement and research by an outstanding early career economist. He's the principal investigator of the European Research Council grant, Macronets, Production Networks in Macroeconomics, and also a recipient of the Lehum Prize Fellowship. Uh, Vasco did not share with me, as far as I know, his presentation, but he did remarkable work helping us to understand how the Great East Japan earthquake propagated through uh, Japan and how input-output linkages were a mechanism for the propagation and amplification of that shock. But I see uh vasco is going to make a more general uh presentation which will nicely complement uh, richard's introduction and international shock propagation vasco's past work that i'm familiar with looked at shock propagation within countries so i'm going to assume that this will continue in the same way unless vasco has internationalized his uh analysis vasco over to you Thank you very much, Aditya. Thank you for the invitation. This certainly beats uh, teaching fractions to my kids, which is what I'm otherwise doing. Um, so, yes, that's what the first thing I was going to say is that you will not see international trade or global in my slide. Um, I do think.
thing I would like to do is to just take a step back and, and notice that um, in economics, the role of supply chain linkages as a source of risk and as a source of synchronization is almost as old as this discipline. I'm not even going to go back to Quesnay and the Tableau Economique, um, but it's been there. The first general equilibrium model by von Neumann is a multi-sector model by, by, by the liberation of the author. The beginning of growth theory is uh, multi-sector models. The beginning of modern business cycle theory with real business cycles is multi-sector. And of course, there's Leontief writing much more beautifully than anyone writes now. Uh, reminding us back in the 30s and 40s uh, how laymen and professional economists and practical planners are all equally aware of existence of some kind of interconnection between even the remotest parts of the national economy. And he goes on to say that the presence of this invisible but nevertheless very real ties can be observed in the synchronization of, say, demand in New York City and, and how that translates into uh, groceries in Detroit or mines in Pennsylvania to textile mills in New England, and that reasserts itself over the business cycle. Right? And so this is a, a very, there's nothing new here. Um, there is an increasing uh, policy awareness. So my understanding is that a national strategy for the US is a step just below a national agency. The US has a national strategy. Uh, for global supply chain security, acknowledging again the disruption to supply chains as a source of uh, global economic risk, right? Be it by natural disasters, be it by uh, criminals targeting uh, the system. Um, and of course, as Leontief told us, uh, these supply chain risk aspects. Uh, tend to reassert themselves with relentless regularity. So this is just a cut from the Financial Times a month ago or so, uh, which was exactly what uh, Richard was saying about the the, the first trans economic contagion from China early on in this process. So having set the stage, I was kind of asked to do two things. I want I was asked to review a little bit evidence on that these supply chain uh, linkages do propagate risk across uh, otherwise largely independent units. Uh, and then I was asked to do some kind of um, material for discussion. So let's try to do both. Uh, I'll start with um, the review of paper on uh, the Great East Japan earthquake. Uh, I want to name my co-authors here, which is Makoto Nire, Yukiko Saito in Japan, and then Ali Reza Tabasale in Northwestern. Um, and kind of, there's, the, the third point for this paper was there was lots and lots of anecdotal evidence out there about how supply chains may be a source of macro risk, and they're assumed so by policymakers. But there's very little systematic evidence. From the point of view of kind of causal strictures that we impose ourselves, we're talking about two fundamental challenges. The first would be, can you identify um, a, a supply chain shock, an individual localized shock? Uh, that's number one. And can you then, uh, number two, um, having had such shock or plausibly exogenous shock, can you trace the shock as it, as it spreads through the network? So we're gonna look at data from Japan in 2011 and try to get some basic magnitude. And then, depending on time, I'll, I'll go for, for a more general discussion of, of what we learned a little bit in Japan or the discussions within Japan at the time that are relevant more globally now. So if I can take you back uh, nine years now, uh, in March 11, 2000, so, so basically nine, nine, and, nine years and 10 days now, there was a triple disaster. There was a, 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 a very large earthquake off the Pacific uh, northeast coast of Japan that started a uh, tsunami, which then uh, ended up hitting a nuclear power plant in Fukushima. Uh, what you have there is a graph of fatalities and essentially human loss in red and uh, physical capital loss in green. And what you see is that, you know, despite being a horrible shock, it is relatively localized in Japan. It affected it's northeast prefectures and 
in particular the seaside prefectures because of the, um, the tsunami. So that we're going to exploit that as our first uh, dictum that we needed, the exogenous large localized eruption. Um, just to remind, you know, I'm going to ve very briefly go over this. This is not the data that we'll be using, but just as a reminder of what happened in Japan then, there's very little high frequency data. This is one snippet of high frequency data that we can show to you, which is a year on year monthly production industry index by prefecture. And what you see in the red line is a 40% year on year decline of industrial production in the affected prefectures. And uh, a relatively strong recovery throughout the month of the year uh, that follows. And in a way, the question of this paper, of this research is, uh, if we take a look at the blue line, that's the entire Japan industrial production and how it evolved throughout the year. And what we know is that the disaster area by simple national accounting, by adding up, is too small to account for a 50% decline of industrial production in Japan on impact and this you know, recover throughout the year. So we are going to try to source firm level data to see if this can come about, if the translating the red line to the blue line as an aggregate outcome, this can come about by supply chain and propagation of these disruptions. How are we gonna do this? We're gonna access a very large firm level database. So Essentially, we're gonna look at which firms are behind this red line. What are the firms that are producing? But not only in services, the database is very broad and covers uh, the, the entire landscape of the economy very thoroughly. And then we're gonna overlay this with three governmental decrees, essentially establishing a disaster area, an emergency area following the earthquake. And we're gonna uh, take advantage of the fact that we know the address of the firms to geolocate them inside these uh, disaster municipalities, which is a subunit of these prefectures that we, that we use. Now, having said this, and you can see them again plotted against the northeast coast of Japan, these like little reddish dots are the firms and their location. Having said that, we don't care about the disaster area in this paper or the fate of these firms. What we care about is the supply chain link through to these firms. And what you're seeing there is the same this database as, um, which is something very valuable and still somewhat unusual, for about a million firms in Japan, that's about two thirds of all the firms in Japan. Um, it has information of suppliers and customers of each firm on the identity, not the quantity of trade between them. So in the topmost graph, I am plotting again the disaster firms that we just identified previously in the graph. And then I have four degrees of separation over the production network or over the supply chain. So what are the red, the second up, uh, the second graph uh, uh, coming from top to bottom? Those are all direct suppliers or direct customers of affected area firms. So these are firms who are headquartered in away from the disaster prefectures, right? Uh, but have direct input output linkages either by being suppliers or customers to disaster area firms that we just identified. And then I can keep go on. I can ask, okay, who are the suppliers? and customers of the red firms. So orange firms are firms that um, are what we call network distance two or supply chain distance two from the disaster area. They are not directly linked. They are not direct customers or suppliers, but they're either suppliers of the suppliers or customers of the customer of disaster area. And then we go, uh, and we continue going uh, for the network buffs out there, the diameter is seven, which means we run out of firms at distance seven. Uh, for the popular culture buffs, this says very much like the Kevin Bacon uh, degrees of separation, the average distance is small. That is economically relevant because it means that within, in between, somewhere in between the orange and the green firms, you cover 50% of the firms in Japan which means modern supply chains are small worlds in their technical definition, meaning uh, 
they are sparse in that most people, most firms are not trading directly with each other, but they are nevertheless indirectly very close. They are two or three links away from the disaster area. Okay? And this is nothing in particular that is special to this disaster area. This is a general feature of modern production networks in the data that we are, that is coming online and we can see. Now, having that, what I want to do, the outcome of interest now is to understand what was the impact of being, uh, say, of the earthquake on non-disaster firms, right? Firms that were linked to disaster area only by their supply chain linkages, either directly and then I would call that distance one, either upstream or downstream, or indirectly, which would be distance two, three, and four. So what we're trying to do here is basically saying, relative to our control group, and our control group here to be, to be clear is firms that are distance five and above from disaster area firms, firms that are very remote in a supply chain sense from the disaster area. Did firms that were closer in a supply chain distance, um, either downstream or upstream, uh, uh, have, can we see an impact on their the level of their sales in the following year? And this is at the yearly frequency. I'm just going to now show you the main headline result uh, at this kind of the micro reduced form. The, in the paper, you will find lots of robustness checks and, and more discussion. But this would be the key outcome. So to read this graph, let's just focus on the blue bars, right? So and, and the circles are the point estimates. Um, so this is saying that in the year following the earthquake, a firm that was a direct customer downstream one of of, of disaster area firms um, declined its sales by 3.6 percent relative to firms that were distance five or above. What we can see is that then you can go for only indirect customers, so downstream two, or customers of customers of customers, downstream three, etc. And we see that this um, there was significant propagation, indirect propagation going downstream, all the way to firms being with four degrees away going downstream from disaster river. On the right side of the graph, we see also see that there was significant upstream propagation. So from, from disaster area firms to their suppliers, upstream one, they lost 3% following the earthquake. To the supplier suppliers, upstream two, they lost 2% and so on and so forth. Okay. So what we're saying here is a large uh, spread, large contagion or cascading behavior of this localized supply chain disruption with effects decaying with network distance as models imply. Uh, and very briefly, I'll note what, what the red dots tell you is that there is no evidence of pre-trend. So these firms did not differ already uh, in their performance already uh, previous to the earthquake. And again, the, the paper has a bunch of, uh, of um, robustness checks I found interesting. So now I just want to take a step back from this very micro level impact. And the first thing you I want to notice is for, for any of you that has looked at firm level data and firm level growth rates and the standard deviation of the firm level growth rate, even the largest of these numbers, 3.6% negative, is not very large. So it's not that the effects for individual firms are large. Rather, the effects may matter in the aggregate because it affects many firms. So if you recall, I told you that about 50% of the firms in Japan are within two steps of the of disaster area firms. And what we can see from the previous thing is that though there are, again, relatively small effects, right? You lost 2%, 3% at most. Um, the fact that are, you are shaving off 2% for 50% of the firms. And that's what generates an aggregate shock, an aggregate movement. Right? Um, it's the fact that there is some propagation and the fact that the production network or the supply chain is wired in such a way that everyone, if you hit a node at random, a production site at random, a lot of people are within a neighborhood of two uh, supply chain linkages away. Right? So this small world aspect of supply chain. 
You can also do formal aggregation in GE rather than back of the envelope aggregation of the effect I told you. And what we're getting now, and we're just computing these as we speak, is that Japan lost about 0.5% of GDP that year due to the earthquake. And that's uh, not very large, but it's in, in line with empirical studies on the effect of, of disaster. It's a threefold magnification from the simple adding up, you know, traditional accounting adding up of, of uh, say, the real value added weight of this. And it's significant for Japan because you need to keep in mind that Japan's growth rate, average growth rate for the last 20 years is 1%. Okay. Now, having, so this kind of gives you that these effects are real, they matter, and they show up in aggregate. And they are arguably causal at a large scale of looking at a million firms, um, firms that are apparently very distant, both geographically in a sector manner and even in supply chain distance, still get affected. Now, I want to just take you a little bit over the discussion that happened in Japan and, and, and mostly around business schools, much less in economics, after the Japan earthquake. I'm thinking about what are strategies to deal with uh, this kind of supply chain risk. Um, and, and this is my own summary. Um, but the way I see this there, you know, at the firm level, I'm thinking first about private sector responses on recognizing supply chain risk. There was the obvious, the obvious first thing that came about was the lack of information. So even very large firms claim that they lost weeks understanding what to do with production because they didn't even know why their input supply stopped. Uh, their direct supplier was up and running. So they did not even know indirectly who, are, who were they linked. And this led to a number of programs led in particular by big firms in Japan of recursively imposing on suppliers. So if you want to be my supplier, you need to tell me who your suppliers are and the suppliers of the suppliers, and the suppliers of the suppliers. The large automakers in Japan try to, try to get, gather information on supply chain. A second um, that I think Richard already kind of briefly touched upon is diversification strategies. This is both of suppliers and ab about production sites, my own production sites, or demanding, for example, that my supplier, if I have one, has two distinct production sites. This is to ensure short-run substitution possibility. And the other, um, which I think we have very little evidence whether it's gone on in practice or not, but there was a discussion certainly about this, is the standardization of components. In particular, you know, one reason why these supply chains are fragile is the myriad of, um, you know, customer demand spec of I want my headlights to have a shade of blue or a shade of pink and I want the color of the car to be this and not that. Right. And that um, variety that is, we think is well for enhancing, um, is, brings about complexity and generates O-ring type problems where everything is ready to go, but the controller of the headlights is not available. And that, that, that leads to a little bit of less choice, less variety and standardization of components. And one reason why these lessons may have not been learned more globally and even without outside of Japan is that these are very costly, as I think Richard was already pointing out. Information is costly and introduces a gap between large firms that can gather information and small firms that do not. Diversification is costly, in particular when you think about relation-specific investments. If I now have two suppliers for the same good, there is much less investment in a particular relation, and it's costly to maintain all these relations. And, and, and the last point is standardization or less variety. And either by direct higher costs or, or lower variety, what this means is if you want to build robustness, this comes at a cost. How large is this cost? It's not clear. The way I would think about it in the first instance is firms whose participation in the supply chain, or in this case in global supply chain, um, the marginal firms are affected. Firms that are basically uh, you know, close to breaking even, if they face a larger cost, they will either not implement these changes or remove themselves from supply chain. Uh, 
large farms this seems to be is uh, what this presents for research. So this area of production networks has expanded enormously over the last 10 years. Um, and has definitely put on the table the notion that there are systemic production firms or sectors, narrowly defined production or actors, Vasco, and I themselves systemic risk. Vasco, another couple of minutes, please. Thank you. Yes, I will I'll finish in one slide. Um, and 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 while it considers that it makes that very clear, it also considers that these supply chains are efficiently are efficient and that there is no room for policy intervention. So frictional environment is something that is just now being looked at seriously. The other thing that is not uh, that there is not a lot of work on, though there is great some great work, is on supply chain formation. So we understand how firms rewire after firms exit, or how firms per, uh, make these linkages to begin with, and microdata being a, a large body. Now I'll finish uh, for policymakers, right? And the situation where we are now, where we've identified clearly some key goods that we need to have them operational. We need ventilators, we need masks, we need tests. Or here in the UK, you, need, you also need flour. Currently, flour has disappeared. Okay. Now, this presents incredible challenges to policymakers, which is uh, typically it's not because the ventilators cannot be done at the final producer. This is because somewhere in the supply chain there's a bottleneck that cannot be overcome in a very short run. So this requires the policymakers to know in real time what are bottlenecks to the production of, of individual goods. And then we would require them to act, and it's not obvious. Again, we've seen that we don't have great theoretical justification for how to ring fence what are deemed to be key supply chains or mandate diversification and capacity. So this presents lots of challenges for policymakers in the sense that information being one of them, most countries in the world do not have this supply chain data that allow them to trace which are the key firms to ensure the production of certain goods. Uh, we do not know, and when I talk to people, exactly what we mean by ring fencing. Uh, and while we, we don't know the, effect, the pernicious effects of those, and we don't have a great justification to enact policy measures that ring fence or ensure diversification or national champion, as Richard would say. So I'm happy to take further discussion in the Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Vasco. That was an excellent, careful, thoughtful presentation. Um, after Richard and Vasco, uh, who have talked uh, about God-made shocks like disease and natural disasters, we will now turn to how these shocks are amplified by man-made shocks in the form of trade restrictions. <clears throat> And for that, we have Simon Evenet, who's a professor of international trade and economic development and MBA director at the University of St. Gallen. Simon has specialized in understanding, monitoring, highlighting protection. At the start of the global financial crisis, Simon created the Global Trade Alert Initiative and this has become the lead, leading independent conscience uh, of the world. And he has highlighted uh, some of the most egregious measures taken by governments and perhaps through shining their, his light on them has disciplined them. Simon, apart from his many other accomplishments, has been a staff member of the World Bank, not once, but twice. And he has been a friend for many of us for a long, long time. So Simon, over to you. Thank you. Uh, in light of uh, what we've known about response to previous global economic shocks, and of course the academic literature and the research literature which has uh, been prepared. 
Now, if I know how to use this uh, technology, I'll try and move through the slides. Great. I'm going to start by uh, discussing the, uh, ch the changes that we have seen this year compared to uh, previous years uh, in the overall global stance. Now, monitoring trade policy is, at some level, quite an unsatisfactory um, uh, endeavor because there are lots of ways that theory would tell us we would like to be able to assess policy stance, ideally in terms of some ad valorem equivalent or the amount of trade which is covered and the like. But much of the information we need to be able to make those types of meaningful calculations isn't available at the time when we, when we need to be able to assess what governments are doing. And so what has tended to happen is that uh, there have been uh, uh, essentially statistics based on counts of measures that uh, governments have undertaken. Now, we can all think of many reasons why those uh, counts are um, potentially misleading or wrong, and I will show you some uh, export coverage data later. But uh, this is the metric which is typically used by the international organizations and uh, one which uh, my team at St. Gallen has been using uh, for 10 years now. So uh, I should say in our work and reports, we do try and report uh, other measures too. But if you want to know what's happening um, right now, then I'm afraid you're stuck with counts. Uh, that's pretty much the only, only game in town. Well, this first slide that I have here on uh, developments this year shows just how different this year has been compared to previous years. If you look back over the years 2009 to 2019, and you look at the measures which were put in place from the 1st of January to the 17th of April, you'll see that uh, your traditional anti-dumping, anti-subsidy, and other measures are, um, are the uh, uh, largest share. They're typically half of shares, half of the measures which are uh, found in the first uh, few months of the year. And then subsidy, trade distorting subsidies are the second largest grouping and then tariff increases. Now, of course, there's variation across years, and you can imagine uh, that this uh, pie chart looked a little bit different during the trade war years. But if you're looking at some type of average to benchmark this year against, then uh, then uh, that's, this is the starting point on the right-hand side. On the left-hand side, we have information on what governments have actually been doing this year, and you can see that the most prevalent form of uh, trade policy intervention, which is harmful to foreign commercial interests, are measures which relate to exports, in particular measures which are restricting exports, about which I'll say more later. So we have a, a, a shift in the mix of uh, trade distortions that we've observed. We can see also that there's a far greater number proportionally of uh, subsidies which have been in, uh, introduced. These are subsidies to import competing firms. And we can see that contingent protection measures, which were the largest category in previous years, is now the third largest category this year. So there does appear to be a trade policy shift uh, which has occurred. And of course, one question we will want to uh, look into over time and in research is whether that uh, had, meaning, had meaningful effects. Now, these uh, summary statistics here are drawn from an initiative where we essentially monitor very carefully what is published on government websites around the world and systematically collect that information. If you're talking about the overall quantum of the number of harmful measures introduced this year, uh, it is below what it was last year. This year, we've had 173 harmful measures which have been documented, uh, which is below the 315 found last year. Uh, but still, this year's uh, numbers are relatively high compared to the 10-year average. So this is the first uh, finding. Now, if we can go to the next slide. Actually, if I could have some help getting to the next slide, I'm find, finding this rather difficult. Um, Ryan or Ale? Um, Ryan? Hi, Simon. Uh, if you just, have you tried pressing uh, the direct, the arrow key? Did that do it? Uh, no. Or pressing down might also. Hold on. No, nope, either of those. Work. Neither of those work. So can I just ask you to? Sure, sure. I'm happy to. That's great. So if we can go to the next slide, I can try and catch up a little bit. Um, the next slide uh, flips, uh, looks at 
not to trade harm, the harmful measures which have been put in place, but the liberalizing measures, and hopefully Ryan will bring this up in a second. Um, and uh, here we have a different uh, pattern which is uh, worth uh, noting. Um, normally between 2009 and 2019, uh, by now we have seen about uh, half of the measures which are introduced, liberalizing measures are tariff measures, about 45% of them. And this, this proportion has increased a lot, uh, or at least somewhat, I should say. And then uh, we also tend to see um, uh, another breakdown in terms of uh, export-related measures, normally the removal of export restraints. But the other big change, if you compare 2020 with earlier years, is uh, that uh, we see far fewer FDI liberalizing measures this year. And this is actually consistent with uh, work that we've seen on the ground, where more governments, if anything, are being moving in a more restrictive way in terms of how they're treating foreign direct investment this year. So overall, then, what we have uh, seen is um, uh, on the harmful side, we see more export-related uh, measures. And on the liberalizing side, we see more tariff cuts and fewer FDI reforms. So this is the overall picture uh, for this particular uh, for the particular year, looking globally across uh, uh, all of the uh, countries of the world. Now, what I'd like to do, since the purpose is to focus a little bit on, on COVID-19, is to look at uh, the developments uh, inside the sector which covers medical equipment, medical supplies, and uh, medicines. And if we could go to the next slide, please, that would be great. Oh, I should have added him. Actually, uh, there's uh, one other point. I, I Now I can see I've uh, missed the order here. Um, before we get to the uh, export to incentives and the export restrictions in medicines and the like, let me um, uh, just quickly say one other thing. Um, although uh, we earlier mentioned the export restrictions being prominent, if you're actually looking at trade affected, the biggest uh, measures this year to date have actually been export incentives which have been offered by countries to their exporters. And so uh, we have seen three such measures. Perhaps the largest such measure was one introduced by China on the 20th of March, which, uh, where they offered uh, higher export incentives through their tax system for uh, products which were um, exported from that country. And we can see that worldwide, uh, the total and the estimate so far uh, of the amount of trade affected by this year's trade distortions is just under half a trillion dollars. And of that, a third of a trillion comes from the export incentives which the, China, which the Chinese uh, and others have offered. And so you can see that a large share of the trade distortions in terms of trade coverage are actually unrelated to the export restrictions, which I'll spend a bit more time looking on. Please be aware that the, the vertical axis on this chart is in log form. I've also put in place the um, uh, in share of trade which is affected by import tariffs, since this is, you know, these are the most salient forms of import, uh, import uh, restrictions. And you can see they pale in, in significance to uh, the um, impact, or, or sorry, the scale of export incentives. So then just to summarize the, what the, the, the changes so far this year, we've seen lots of export restrictions, but the uh, policy which, um, which is probably affecting the most trade are actually export incentives. <clears throat> These export incentives, by the way, are typically very poorly documented by either the international organizations or in uh, economic research. We now have more research on the VAT rebates uh, done by China. Uh, there is a growing literature on this, but I should say that these are uh, the, you know, the principal form of uh, trade distortion that we saw uh, at the turn of the last global economic crisis, and also it seems to be today as well. If we can move on to the next slide, please. Um, then I'll turn now to the export curbs with respect to uh, medical, products, me med medical products and medicines. Uh, what we have found this year, and this has received, of course, a lot of attention, uh, given the salience of the uh, pandemic, is that over time, more and more countries have uh, imposed different types of export curbs on med medical products and medicines. At the moment, we're counting that 76 nations have limited the uh, exportation of different types of medical supply. Not all countries have done it the same way, and they have not all covered the same degree of products, but we do see um, a spread over time uh, in uh, the measures which have been taken. And uh, this uh, spread has occurred from uh, the source of the uh, virus uh, westward over time, as we have seen, um, as, as the virus has spread, so the export 
constraints of spread. I should say that if you're thinking of a product like medical ventilators, then uh, uh, countries like Australia, uh, Mexico, Canada and Japan are now pretty much the only suppliers which are available to, uh, to uh, send uh, these important pieces of medical equipment to the rest of the world. All of the other suppliers have some type of uh, uh, export ban in place. So this is, I think, a highly salient uh, topic. The literature, as we know, on export curbs is uniformly damning. A lot of the great work done on this was done on the export curbs associated with the agricultural uh, sector, and, and in particular with respect to the 2008 to 2010 commodity price spike. Much of it was done actually at the World Bank and by World Bank affiliates. Um, and of course, what makes that research so much easier is that we have world prices or national market prices for these commodities. Most medical products, on the other hand, are so differentiated that I suspect we will not have the same uh, uh, we will not have the same rich data sets to be able to do that type of research. We'll probably have more uh, narrower focused research. But still, the work that has been done by Michele Ruter and colleagues has shown that uh, the estimated impact on prices of these export curbs uh, can be significant. If we could move on to the next slide, please. I'd like to talk about something which has received a lot of attention as well, which are export curbs on food. Um, this is re these have uh, begun to receive a lot of attention from policymakers and, and the press. I think it's important to point out, um, clearly this is a potentially important matter which needs to be tracked over time, but we are nowhere near the same degree of uh, uh, prevalence of export curbs in food that we have seen in medical products. Really, in terms of the major producers, there's only one which has curbed exports uh, in a serious way, and that's Russia so far. This may change, of course, and we'll have to watch it carefully, uh, but uh, we do see um, a much more limited uh, ex exportation curbs in this particular sector. And we have also seen tracking countries here that the political economy of these curbs are quite interesting. A number of countries put in place curbs which are extremely aggressive, often bans, and then they face pressure uh, from farmers and from internal um, forces within a government uh, which uh, in, end up uh, causing the export measure to be relaxed. And we've seen a bit of that uh, going on in countries like Vietnam and Romania. So there's a very interesting political economy story unfolding there as well. Simon, so this is with respect minute, to food. Please. Yep, and let me just uh, quickly uh, move on to the next slide, and I think that's uh, my takeaway slide, so I can wrap up. So what are the main takeaways? The first is we do see um, uh, some differences between this year and previous years. Uh, pre, uh, the previous decade um, saw a much more uh, traditional pattern of trade policy intervention with uh, resorts to subsidies and to contingent protectionism. This year we see uh, a lot of subsidies, uh, but we also see uh, many more export restraints. Uh, we will, it, it's, it's unclear uh, what will happen next, but uh, if we do have a collapse in world trade, which has been forecast, then there will be concerns that this may lead to a, an, a, an unleashing of lots of protectionism, and we'll have to track that uh, very carefully and see what form that protectionism will take. When it comes to the impact on development sensitive areas, clearly the, the impact on medical supplies and food are a concern, but we see many more uh, impacts and many more effects in the area of, uh, sorry, many more interventions in the area of medical supplies than food at the moment. And the last point I would make is that whilst export restrictions get a lot of attention uh, from the media and alike, and they are very, very salient for good reasons, uh, often the most um, pervasive uh, forms of protectionism or trade distortion are actually uh, measures to increase exports, uh, which governments take, which amount to um, market share stealing or market share reallocation away from trading partners towards subsidized firms. And this is what we should be watching as well uh, as this uh, COVID uh, pandemic unfolds. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simon, for that important and um, careful presentation. Um, before we open up for questions, I uh, have been asked to take stock and make some um, uh, observations. The three questions we could ask at this juncture. The first is how production interdependence leads to a transmission of shocks. And that's a question that Richard and Vasco 
addressed. The second question is how the shock that we are witnessing today is leading to a disruption of global value chains today. And the third question is how does the shock and the policy response to the shock lead to a longer term reorganization of global value chains? I think in the discussion now, it would be great to hear from all of you and from the speakers is how is this shock different? You know, as I said at the beginning, this is not like the Japanese tsunami. It's not like the American mortgage crisis. It is a shock that's virtually simultaneously affecting many different parts of the world. It's also unusual that it's not so much a shock that is disrupting manufacturing capacity some of the biggest changes we are seeing are in the services sectors. So what does that mean when a large part of the economy, which is relatively less dependent on backward value chains, but perhaps more important in forward value chains, how should we think in terms of the nature of this shock as different? And how do we expect it to be transmitted differently? When we think of the disruption, how is it the types of stages of production that are being affected? Uh, you know, high density collective consumption, high density collective production, face to face interaction. How do we expect those also to lead to a disruption in global value chains? And then when we think about the longer term, I think Vasco very nicely set out the kind of issues, but there are, as he said, a tension between acquiring more information and the big benefits of delegation, the tension between diversifying versus efficiency, precisely because of relationship specific investments that these global value chains require, and also a tension between the standardization, which would make it easy for you to switch and the customization, which is increasingly a feature of these international production relations. And I do think that even though Simon said it's not just export restrictions, the fact that we are seeing export restrictions, I think could have a particularly pernicious effect, not just on global value chains, but on trade, because they suggest that trade is not a reliable way of dealing with difficult circumstances. The whole idea that if in bad states of the world, countries import export restrictions on food and medical supplies, then it does legitimize uh, greater self-sufficiency, even in good states of the world. So how should we think about that? And especially when all our existing multilateral institutions, it, even in their prime, they were not able to discipline these export restrictions how is it that we can think of new international cooperative arrangements which preserve the huge gains from this um, fragmentation of production both in terms of productivity and diffusion of technology so i think these are the questions that are important you know we are doing some work here with caroline freund daria taglioni michele ruta to try and understand both the short run and the long run implications of these changes. But it'd be great to hear now from all of you, but let me open up the for questions. Uh, one, uh, uh, you can use YouTube, you can use uh, WebEx. And let me begin with one question, which has come from Sabrina Holman, who's asking, any thoughts, views on the impact of these disruptions on current and potential trade agreements, regional agreements. So perhaps Richard, you can begin and then the others can step in if they wish. And after that, I'll try and keep track of questions and bundle them together. Richard, are you there? Let me, oh, sorry, yeah, I'm on, I had thought about it, but let, let me, um talk about uh, what I think happened, for example, in NAFTA, I think there's been less disruption and less export restrictions within NAFTA. And I think within Europe also, there was a, an initial push that blocked a lot of stuff within Europe, but then it was 
allowed inside Europe, but not outside Europe. So I think to my, my, my instinct would be that where we're going to, especially in things like medical, is uh, part of the regional agreements would be not to block each other's exports in, these, in this time of need. So I think it may, may come to have clubs of people who promise not to block food or medical equipment or something like that. But I have to say that I, I think a lot of, of this will, apart from the med medical equipment, I think a lot of it will pass. And the vast majority of trade in chemicals and vehicles and electrical equipment and electronics, that stuff is not going to be changed because the, the basic political economy, which led to the diverse, led to the global value chains, isn't going to change. And uh, so I, I think a lot of this discussion, oh my goodness, now we have to change everything, is not going to go through. But anyways, uh, with respect to regional um, regional trade agreements, I think that's where the restrictions have sort of been not not extended. So NAFTA is trading with each other, Europe is trading with each other. I don't know the situation in Asia. Simon, do you want to come in on that? Yeah. Yes, if I, yes, if I may. Um, I think there's a, a very interesting question which is raised by your question and Sabine's question about reciprocity, because we typically think that if a country liberalizes a, uh, its import regime in the context of a trade agreement, the payoff comes not only to the benefits from uh, importing, but also for the benefits from uh, being able to export to other countries. But that calculus gets disturbed in if uh, uh, it turns out that if you liberalize your import tariffs to let in um, imports, but if there are no imports to buy because the other party is using export curbs, especially on essential you know, items when you need them, then a lot of the benefit from liberalizing your trade your trade regime has been um, has been lost. And so what we learn then is that the, so the benefits from reciprocal uh, trade reform, I think, are conditional on being able to somehow qualify or limit the use of these um, export restrictions. And here I just build a bridge to what Richard said. There are a number of trade agreements which have tried to qualify the use of export restrictions. Interestingly, some are in North America and some involve North American countries with uh, Latin American countries. And uh, it would be interesting to see if uh, the disruption to supply chains there or the threat of such disruption was perceived as being much lower as a result. Thank you, Simon. Uh, Vasco, two questions for you. Uh, one from Tristan Reed, and I think from Key, uh, is what are the most promising proposals to enhance the resilience of supply chains, and especially medical supply chains? And here, if I can paraphrase the question, that would it be a good idea if firms don't do it themselves to mandate greater holding of inventories or essential inputs? Vasco, you have to unmute yourself. Here we go, sorry. Um, thanks a lot for the question. I think that's a good question. Um, I think what I am seeing from many conversations and from uh, I think Richard was discussing this ahead of the in our you know we had a small pre discussion to the conference. I think the most promising thing or, or the most positive thing that I'm seeing around the world is the deployment of massive data that is on the information side, if you want, of what we were discussing before. So even countries where an understanding of what is your supply chain, what are your supply chain risks, can you map out the supply chain with some detail? Can you tell me what you require to produce ventilators? Which was a kind of a pipe dream, I would say, 20 years ago. Um, if you asked me two years ago to do that on a systematic level, uh, at least nation by nation, it was still a pipe dream. And what I am seeing in this crisis is governments and policymakers and uh, advisors um, actually implementing very interesting uh, solutions with payment system data, with transaction data, with banking data, which is a first step in understanding what can be done. 
in understanding what are bottlenecks in your supply chains. Where do you stand as a macro risk if plant X goes down? Right? A couple of years ago, I, we had this, we found, or I found out that half of the world's hard disk drives were, popular, were produced in a valley in Thailand, I believe. And then the valley flooded and uh, hard disk drives price doubled overnight. Um, I think we, we are now living in a world where we actually are, realize, are are much more aware and can map out these risks. And that's the first step for policy. Um, so I think that's been an exciting development. Now to go from there to what can actually governments do in terms of shoring up our, in terms of um, ring fencing, what, what national interest, entire supply chains around national interest. Uh, is something that I think we are far from. So I, su I, su I suspect that at most we will be able to deliver the capacity to start thinking about these things. Um, I can tell you that you know the UK and Spain and different governments that I've been in touch are thinking very thinking ambitiously about these things, trying to figure out exactly what do I need to ensure. Uh, production at the current level of demand of good X. And I think we are very, very close to having, you know, relatively scientific answers to those questions. But I think politically, in terms of the political economy of that, and all that can go wrong along that path, something that we haven't sought and that I would like to think a little bit more. Um, I, I know that this is, is, is for sure happened with, with medical supplies to go back to you. Uh, Vasco, thank you. There's another question, if again, I can paraphrase from Hatem uh, Chabani. And he is, uh, or she is, uh, asking about, you, you know, are you taking into account, uh, how, how are you thinking about switching costs on both the consumer and the supply side when you think of disasters, number one? And secondly, uh, is it not possible that just as disasters or value chains transmit shocks, they are also able to diffuse shocks? Isn't a global value chain itself an exercise in diversification, even though you know the Leontief, the interdependence makes you vulnerable to these O-ring kind of problems? Should we not see that as a, a positive side of global value chains? Um, right, so let me yeah, give you an experience I'll, I'll of, an automaker, yeah, on, of an automaker in Japan. Uh, so they turned out that after a few days, they realized they didn't have a pigment to paint the car, to, to form the paint to paint the car. And that's a relation specific investment because the automaker makes um, guarantees to the final consumer on you know 10 years or we'll paint the car for free for you that there will be no rust and again it goes according to spec of what is the color exact color that the consumer asked for um that so switching was so costly in that sense and it was not there was not their car paint in the world is that that's a relation to think of investment for the automaker that the automaker shut down his plant and send his workers to rebuild the plant of the supplier. Um, now, what that tells you is that switching costs are high, and even if you plan for them ex ante, um, you can have, uh, you can destroy the value of relation-specific investment. Remember, what we think by relation-specific investment is uh, that I share there is some kind of private good that, is, that I cannot go just to the market on eBay and find another supplier. Is I, sh I create value with you, my supplier, and we share the rent of that. This, uh, the notion of bilateral monopoly over that. When you destroy that bilateral monopoly, say by diversifying, say by maintaining multiple suppliers at the same time, you destroy the incentives that underlie these, these, these relations, and therefore you destroy value. That's number one. 
So the other thing that you've talked about, and this will follow all the way to final consumers and costs that, that are probably passed through to the final consumer. Um, the other thing you said is, can they be, um, are we speaking to negatively as supply chains as just a conductor of shocks rather than dissipator of shocks? And of course, you're right. It, there is just kind of the clean thinking there is what is the counterfactual? The counterfactual is uh, to have everything, all my eggs in one basket and have all my production in, in my country. Well, that is first, you're going to lose large efficiency gains from comparative advantage reasons, but you're also going to be subjecting yourself to much more risk. So it depends on what your counterfactual is. Yes, supply chain, global supply chains pose transmission of risk. But your counterfactual, I would venture to say, is more risk and more concentrated, precisely for the reasons you say. So I, say, I do think this dissipation is there, and that's one of the reasons, apart from efficiency reasons, the dissipation of, reason, of risk relative to having all the production concentrated domestically and all your supply chain that, that leads us where we are now. Thank you, Vasco. Richard. Uh, you were uh, relatively sanguine about what might happen to global value chains, but here is a question from Roberto Echandi, who says that discussions on vulnerability of GVCs may suggest that you know the private sector is not sufficiently sensitive and it may justify protectionist policies. And at a time when developing countries had finally embraced trade and benefited from GVCs, would, could we now be entering a slippery slope of uh, protectionism? And a related question from uh, someone else is that given that uh, uh, countries are simplifying uh, their, I think it's key, uh, uh, their documentation and various things to help their traders, could this be a time where we can actually, you know, aim for greater harmonization or simplification and trade facilitation? Good. So let, let me address those one at a time. So <clears throat> I don't think we're heading towards an increase in protectionism here. And I think uh, Simon's chart showed that actually even the Trump administration is liberalizing tariffs because they realize there are pluses to uh, imports, not just minuses to imports. And what it is, is what we're worried about uh, the slippery slope to export protectionism. So let, let me just take that in, in, um, in, in two bits. So one, when the GATT was set up and when the uh, European Union were set up, wartime embargoes and shortages were front of mind of the people who wrote these documents. So all this kind of export restrictions are legal on purpose, but it was never really an issue uh, in the in the post-war world because supply was never a constraint. All you needed was demand. So it was all about restraining people from protectionism, uh, not, not from export restraints. So I suspect we may see a greater realization that we also need to coordinate on restraining export restraints as well, especially in food. And we've seen this movie when it comes to food before. There's, there's nothing new about export restrictions tumbling out of control on food. It happened in 2006, 2007, or 2007, 2008, I think was the last time it happened. So maybe we'll have more um, liberalization on that. In terms of the second question about the harmonization, we have seen some incredible things where it's, it's difficult for countries to import masks that are made to a Chinese standard, even though they're basically the same as an American standard, but the American standard was put in there more or less as a protectionist device. So this may again be one of these realizations that, that it is a moment where we can reflect. But I, I would again say, I think most of this reflection is being spun out too generally. So this is in medical equipment and a few things which are actually, uh, I think the total is 7% of world trade is in these things. And the vast majority, all these lessons we're learning are not gonna go on to the big volume trade things because there hasn't been a change. But let, let me come back to something you asked before about stock holding. And so in Switzerland, we're very vulnerable to imported food, imported medical, imported all sorts of things. And so the Swiss government mandates stock holding 
that's done in cooperation with the private sector and subsidized. And that's the way we deal with the supply shocks. And I think many countries in terms of food, which where this is re realized, have food stocks. So I think one of the solutions, instead of trying to bring all the production home, you just have a buffer stock and you cooperate with that and may have to subsidize that. But I think that's a better solution. And I think in the end, when we're done with this, people will say that these global value chains were actually a savior because, for example, China can now make masks when they couldn't before. And uh, when the U.S. industry is getting shut down, they can import masks and tests and things like that. So at the end of this whole story, which is going to go on for another couple of years, I think trade will be viewed as a massive insurance policy, not as a source of, of uh, contagion. Thank you, Richard. Simon, a, a question for you. Have you seen any evidence on how these different measures that you described, both the export uh, promotion measures or import restriction measures, are having an effect on actual trade patterns or on global value chain? Right, so the developments this year are just simply too, um, too fresh for us to have any serious empirical work. But as I said to you earlier, with respect to export restraints, and we have a you know, fantastic research which has been done on mainly on the uh, ag agri-food sector, which I think has a clear set of conclusions about the counterproductive nature of these export restraints. Um, whether that carries over to uh, medical goods, we will see. But I think the benchmark, the, uh, the starting point, is uh, uh, quite well established in the literature. With respect to export uh, promotion measures, there is a, a growing literature uh, which uses quite sophisticated uh, gravity equation work, which looks to see uh, if export growth into third markets is faster for countries where the products have been subsidized compared to other non-subsidized uh, exports from other countries, of course, controlling for all other factors. Uh, and we do find, indeed, quite uh, strong effects for market share reallocation. So I think there, there, the finding is that uh, trade actually gets increased by uh, these export promotion measures, but also gets redistributed as well and reshuffled between uh, trading partners. And of course, this is where it becomes uh, both a trade policy and a resource misallocation problem. Let me just quickly summarize the last few questions that have come in. One. Could it be that the worst is behind us and now it's only a question of stimulating demand? How does the oil price decline figure in all your um, assessments? And is there a chance that China's early recovery is going to lead also to a reassessment and a reconfiguration of value chains? Now, I'll leave it to each of you to decide whether or which question to respond to. Uh, but also, please take a minute to sum up and uh, conclude and uh, what has been a most uh, uh, illuminating discussion. So why don't we go in the order of uh, the Simon, you go first and then Vasco stays second and Richard concludes. Well, thank you and thanks for organizing uh... This particular session. I, let me just address the question, is the worst over? Um, I strongly doubt it. I think even if one does not believe that there will be uh, substantial across the board tariff increases, I do think we will, we will have to watch very carefully whether the uh, measures which governments are using to uh, subsidize firms go beyond just traditional liquidity support into something a little bit more uh, sinister in terms of uh, either bailing out failing firms or um, firms which were failing before the pandemic, let me put it that way, or uh, attempts to try and uh, foster new industries or indeed to repatriate uh, supply chains. We're already seeing um, some of that. Perhaps the most prominent example is the Japanese government putting a lot of money on the table to Japanese firms to repatriate our uh, supply chains out of China. Uh, and so we'll have to watch that carefully to see if uh, the trade distortions of the future are going to be anything like the ones we've seen in the past. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Vasco? So, to, to try to wrap up, um, I think there was a question there regarding is the worst over and are we going to go out of this? 
I think it's a little bit uh, related to the your, your own initial question of what is the nature of this shock and uh, what is awaiting us both now versus the future, right? Um, so I, it's just a set of, of, of factors. Right? So one is related to the length of the shock and, and how do we expect, and I think that will play a role in the sense that as Richard said early on, there was not a productive capacity was not affected. There was no fundamental reason why we should uh, rewire global value chains or domestic chains. Um, as the the recession lengthens in time, when you start factoring in um, inefficient exit, we you know and, and have this piles up over time. There may be larger effects in the sense of. Um, you know, the macro effects done by inefficient liquidation of large parts of the productive of productive uh, side of the economy. And if we go along that scenario, um, then there may be very large effects on, 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 on trade and, and, and longer lasting. Um, so I think that that's kind of, it shines a light on the, the, the need for, you know, all of these national pol uh, policies of liquidity and some, some sort of, of supply um, reassurance of, of kind of reassurance of, of the production side maintained. Um, there's really a trade-off between what is uh, protectionism versus what is protecting inefficient liquidation on a massive scale if this continues going on. Second point is, you know, what is the effect generally on if if there is what I try to say is there may be. Uh, costly manners of robustifying a little bit, be it, uh, and I've kind of covered a few ways, Richard has just said stockpiling in key areas would be another one. I believe all of these are costly, but I believe all of these are costly at the margin. So they are, they, they will, you know, at worst, diversity, variety will go down a little bit, or costs will go up a bit. Given large benefits of global trade, what you, what economics would, uh, you know, the last 20 years, looking at heterogeneous firms, what we say is, it is the, the firms at the threshold of participating that we will see disappearing. But as we know, these firms, the bulk of global trade is accounted by very large firms. To the extent that the, the surplus that those are generating is only, only somewhat affected by any robust, there, there is, a path that is feasible in the sense of robustifying the system without large uh, large costs and large disruption in global value chain. And the final point that is a little bit too far away from here is, of course, this all depends on political economy. So the way we manage this as societies and as citizens and, uh, and politicians, um, you know, turns to protectionism, turns to disintegration, uh, may may be on the cards, but that is less, and it's, um, so I think there's a lot about how, uh, rather than just thinking about it as strict demand or supply side policies, but as policies that try to uh, keep negative political economy developments from, 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 from gaining foothold, which would indeed send the system into very non-linear dynamics where crisis can happen and disintegration can happen. Thank you, Vasco. Richard, final minute. Okay, let, let me just uh, talk a little bit about the oil uh, and this wraps back also into your question about trade and services. So the oil price normally would be a stimulus to having bigger global value chains and, and, uh, and getting things getting cheaper. But as um, a, a, an ebook that Simon Evan and I are editing on, on export restrictions that'll come out on Monday or Tuesday next week, we have uh, a couple chapters on sea transportation and air cargo. And it turns out that both of those have been heavily disrupted by the COVID restrictions directly. So the price of oil isn't what's holding up or hindering uh, global value chains from moving. It's actually direct disruptions to sea transportation and air cargo. So let me go the my the wrap up point. The, the thing I would say is this movie's not even near the end. We don't even know what this movie is really about yet. And the lessons that people are trying to draw from the early, early stages 
of this, I think, uh, are slippery um, and, and not very useful. So at the end, I think uh, people will be very happy that they had access to the manufacturing sectors of other countries and the food producing countries, sectors of other countries. And, and really at the end of this, what we may come out of it is that we may want to all agree not to restrict things except in disciplined ways. So we may end up with rounds of uh, limiting export restriction and that's sort of the, the longer thing, the longer takeaway is that cascading or spirals of export restrictions are as dangerous as cascading or spiraling protectionism and therefore we need international negotiations to do that. Now, of course, all that re requires the administration in the United States to change. So um, it, it, it will depend for what, what happens in November. But if the administration changes, I think there is a real chance that we will have a moment of cooperation to reshape things, to remove some of the, the tariffs that were put up and remove some of the restrictions in a kind of a big talk. Maybe you could call it the Biden round or something, in which case discussing export restrictions could be part of it. So I'll, I'll just stop there. Thank you very much, Richard, Simon, Vasco, for a deeply insightful and richly stimulating discussion. Thank you. Bye-bye.